Okay, we are now recording. All right, well, I'm really uh, excited to introduce our uh, seminar speaker this week, Ian Howitt from The Ohio State University. And uh, Ian got his PhD at UC Santa Cruz, where I believe he intersected with Justin Revenaugh briefly. So there may be some interesting stories there that we can hear about later. I'm still recovering from that. <laughs> oh, we definitely want the stories then, yes. Um, and Ian, after his PhD, did some postdoctoral work at uh, looks like a joint University of Washington, Colorado project. Uh, but then he's been at Ohio State for his, uh, his professorial career since 2008 and is now and uh, has been for the past few years, the director of the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center there. He works on the dynamics of glaciers and ice sheets, which we will clearly hear about today, uh, and their response to climate change. Uh, he uses a variety of techniques, uh, including remote sensing, which has been uh, an important point of intersection with our School of Earth and Environmental Sciences through the Polar Geospatial Center, where Ian has, is uh, one of the PIs on that, uh, on that center. Uh, I've been impressed looking at his CV at some of his awards, including uh, a Graduate Faculty Teaching Award, a Mentor Award, and also a Scholar, a Distinguished Scholar Award at Ohio State. So um, lots of really <laughs> interesting um, uh, distinctions there. So I'll just, with that, uh, take it away, Ian. I'm looking forward to your talk. All right, thank, thanks a lot, Donna, and, and thanks everybody for um, attending yet another Zoom in this never-ending season year uh, age of Zooms. Um, I, I, I definitely appreciate, and uh, I wish I could be there in person. I really enjoy coming out there to visit, um, but hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, so just uh, uh, Donna already told you a bit about what I, what I do, so I just thought I'd give you a quick background here. So yeah, I'm a trained glaciologist. I, I find myself distracted with other things, but um, generally I'm looking at ice sheets and uh, my group and I uh, spend a lot of time doing full field work. Well, not so much field work these days, but um, in the past, not so distant past, we've been out on glaciers measuring them, uh, but also looking at ice from space and uh, looking at how their, their mass is changing. So looking at ice sheet wide processes like this map up here in Greenland and the change in mass through time. And I'll be talking about that in the talk. And uh, also zooming in and looking at smaller scale processes like uh, this work by my PhD student, Alison Chartrand, who's mapping changes in ice shells. And you can see uh, masses gaining in blue and masses losing in red. And uh, we're able to do this by the powerful capabilities given to us by the Polar Geospatial Center and their access to remote sensing imagery. So um, I've been privileged to work with them on these uh, massive data production projects, including the REMA, the Reference Elevation Model of Antarctica, and the Arctic DIM, and, and now the Earth DIM. Um, really amazing thing to be part of. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about this problem that I'm sure you're aware of, and it I'm at, I'm at least assuming you have this, uh, this understanding of the problem where we have these ice sheets and they get some amount of snowfall. That's their in, that's their input. They had, they melt by some rate that melt goes into the ocean and then the ocean water evaporates and we repeat the cycle again. And as long as nothing's changing too quickly, we have nice stable coastlines and some people decide to live on them. So the problem is when one of these arrows increases, and of course the problem is the melt arrow increasing because we have these greenhouse gases that are increasing the rate of melt. Um, none of the arrows or other arrows are increasing too much. So that means that the ice sheets get smaller and the oceans get bigger and those silly people on the coasts get unhappy. So uh, really we're wondering how fast that's gonna happen uh, and how quickly we're gonna lose our coastline. So, uh, you know, the, of course, the past is the key to the future. So we always uh, look at the paleo record for perspective uh, and the paleo record is pretty scary. So if we look at uh, the present day and the current rate of uh, the current amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, and then we look at past climates, past interglacials, uh, 
So the last interglacial 125,000 years ago, the one before that, and we go back to the Pliocene, uh, we see conditions that were similar today in terms of temperature and carbon dioxide levels um, or lower carbon dioxide levels than today, uh, but higher sea levels and substantially higher sea levels. So if we go back to the last interglacial, the temperature was about the same as today. There was le actually less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, but the sea levels were uh, quite a bit higher. And then as we go further back in time, we get warmer temperatures uh, and less ice and higher sea levels. And we go back all the way to the Pliocene three million years ago when we had about as much uh, carbon dioxide as we have in the atmosphere today. We have two to three degrees warmer temperatures we have much higher sea levels and we may not have had really much of a Greenland ice sheet and we'd have had a substantially smaller Antarctic ice sheet. So uh, if that's where we're heading, we've got some problems. So if we look also at the uh, ocean isotope record, so this is, our, um, this is our, our, our measurement of how big the ice sheets are in the past going, this is always confusing to me with uh, how, how they plot uh, time increasing to the left instead of right. But if we go back in time and then we come forward in time and look at times of less ice going up and times of more ice going down, we find that we go to less ice. So we rapidly lose ice much faster than we grow ice sheets. So that would tell us that ice sheets get bigger much slower than they, or get, ice sheets get smaller much faster than they get bigger. And uh, we'll find out why that is uh, by the end of this talk, hopefully. So when I started out uh, in science, I think this came out of a, a textbook. Uh, this is when you think about the Earth system in the late 1990s, this was the, the paradigm of, of response of the Earth system on various time scales. And ice sheets was, were kind of right up there with mantle isostatic response on the time scales of thousands of years for relevant response to climate. Uh, but of course, observations have told us that, that there's a, a much faster response time uh, for these ice, ice sheets. They're much more coupled to the climate system. And just looking at the past 30 years, 30 to 40 years of mass balance measurements, uh, we see rapid changes in both ice sheets much faster than we would have predicted uh, at the end of the 20th century. So uh, both ice sheets are contributing an increasing amount to sea level. Uh, and if we look at uh, now the, the comparison of our observations to our past predictions, this is looking at the, um, the IPCC report before the last one, so AR5, uh, and their projections starting from the year 2000 forward, we see that over that following 10 years, our observations show us following the bad, bad AR5 scenario. Uh, so the kind of the worst case predictions. And if we push those out forward in time, we're finding increasingly uh, faster rates of sea level rise due to ice sheet loss. So if we look at the sea level since the last ice age, so during the Holocene, uh, what really stands out are what I, I think of as these ice loss cliffs. So these periods of time where we had rapid sea level rise that were, that were 10, even 20 times faster than today. So here we are, uh, now time is going as it should from left to right. Um, and we start back the last glacial maximum. We have sea level rising. Uh, it rises pretty quickly, especially in these pulses where we reach over three, in this case, three and a half centimeters per year, one and a half centimeters per year. And then around eight, 7,000 years ago, things leveled off. And we've been at this a uh, pretty stable sea level all of this period of time, which is of course the period of time where we've built complex cities along the coasts. Now, if we flip that over and we think about, instead of sea level rise, we think about ice mass through time because most of this is driven by loss of ice. What we see are, are these ice loss cliffs. So we have uh, the deglaciation happening in these rapid pulses punctuated or stable periods punctuated by rapid pulses that are these cliffs. Uh, so really the question is, are we going to face any of these cliffs? Because if we slowly deglaciate over time, that's something we can probably handle through mitigation and engineering. But if we were to face 10 times faster, 20 times faster sea level rises, 
we would have much harder time engineering through that. So I think of uh, ice loss kind of as ski hills. So you have your easiest case, which is a nice linear uh, predictable decrease through time and ice mass. You have your kind of intermediate case where you might have a rapid acceleration, but then it kind of mellows out. Uh, but then you might face a cliff. And that's what we're trying to look out for because we have a hard time dealing with that. So first we've got to define what a cliff is and really what is catastrophic collapse? What is catastrophic ice loss? Um, so we can just look at some numbers of, uh, we can look at this in terms of the numbers of people that would need to be moved. So the exodus rate per year, and this is in millions of people per year, per rate of sea level rise. So we have centimeters per year on the left. So this is about where we're at now, 0.3. And to the 10 to the six, to the kind of million level, million person per year level, we're about at zero. Now, of course, people are being displaced, but uh, we haven't really hit huge numbers yet. Uh, but if we pump that sea level rise by about twice as much, then we could start seeing about half a million people uh, being displaced per year which is about equal to the decline in, in the European birth rate. So in theory, those people could go and replace all of the Germans that aren't having babies. And then if we uh, raise the sea level rise again, double it again to about a centimeter per year, now we're really starting to push a lot of people around. We're starting to move uh, the equivalent of uh, a, a city, uh, a major US city like uh, you know, probably Minneapolis or greater Minneapolis at least per year. And then once we get to two centimeters per year, now we're having to move something like Los Angeles a year. So, you know, you could, you could kind of put this nice round number of a one centimeter per year sea level rise as something that would be catastrophic. So really we can boil the question down to, are the ice sheets capable of contributing to a sea level rise of more than one centimeter per year? So the first question we could ask then is, is there enough heat to do that? So what we're asking is melt, is there enough heat to melt ice sheets at a rate of one centimeter per year. So one centimeter a year, we can convert that to a mass and that we know how much heat it takes to melt a mass of water. So we can convert that to about 40 terawatt, terawatts of extra heat needed to melt one centimeter per year sea level rise equivalent. And that gives us about a radiative forcing of about 0.16 watts per meter squared. Okay, so what does that number mean? What's 1.6 watts per meter squared? Well, we can compare that to the current imbalance at the top of the atmosphere. So this is the amount of the imbalance between radiation coming in and radiation going out. And that's um, much larger. That's about 1.1 watts per meter squared with an uncertainty that's actually greater than the radiative force needed to give us that one centimeter per year. And then if we compare that to current greenhouse gas forcing, which is about three watts per meter squared, again, much, much higher than the forcing needed. So there's plenty of heat. We're getting way more heat uh, than we need to melt that, to give us that one centimeter per year. And uh, a, a kind of a broader implication here too, is that it takes a relatively tiny amount of extra heat to melt an ice sheet. Okay, so heat isn't the problem. And if you were to take that amount of heat, that one centimeter per year uh, equivalent sea level rise of heat needed to melt that, um, it's only the equivalent of about, what, 0 0.005 degrees Celsius change in temperature of the upper 200 meters, the photic zone of the ocean. So we can't even resolve uh, the amount of heating that would be going into the ocean. Okay, so we can get the heat, but can that heat get to the ice? The ice is in the polar regions. Uh, can, that, can, all, can we move that heat to those, uh, or can we, that heat get to the surface of the ice in order to melt it? Uh, so we have that 40 terawatts of heat. We can then distribute it over ice surface. Uh, the total land ice area is about 15 million square kilometers, but Antarctica is mostly, except for kind of the bits sticking up towards South America and on the edges, uh, is mostly below, well below freezing. So we got to take that away. Um, and then glaciers, the way they sit up at high elevations and spill down, most of their area is not melting either. So once we take all that away, we're left with about only one to two million square kilometers that we can apply that heat to. Uh, so if that's the case, we would need 20 to 40 watts per meter squared on average an increase in the surface energy imbalance. And that's huge. That's uh, more than 10 times CO2 forcing. So we can't just 
send that heat onto the ice and expect to melt it. We've got to get the heat there in other ways. And so the other big heat sink on, the, on this Earth's surface is the ocean. And so if we take that uh, one centimeter per year sea level rise equivalent of heat, that total energy is 1.2 zeta joules per year, which is a huge, huge number. But if we looked at how much the upper ocean has warmed over the past 50 years because of radiative, extra radiative forcing, we find that's warmed by the equivalent of about 200 zeta joules. So what that means is we've already stored enough heat in the upper ocean to give us the equivalent of 1.5 meters worth of sea level rise from ice melt. Okay, so the heat is there. It just needs to get to the ice. So can the heat get to the ice? Well, if it does, it's going to have to travel through the ocean to the polar regions and then interact with the ice at the ice ocean boundary. And ice ocean, whoop, ice ocean boundaries look like this. You have an ice sheet flowing in. You have a grounding zone where the ice gets thin enough that it becomes buoyant and lifts off the bed and then flows into an ice shelf that breaks up and forms icebergs that float away. So the ocean would have to get into this cavity and melt. And it does that, and it melts about 1,200 gigatons of ice per year uh, from the margins, mostly in Antarctica with a little bit more in Greenland. Uh, so that would mean that a one centimeter per year sea level rise would require about a three times increase in that rate of loss, in that rate of melt. Is that possible? Well, I don't think it's impossible, but it seems much more likely that to get that centimeter per year, we would need some increase in melt, but then we would need some dynamical feedbacks. We would need a rapid feedback that would, a positive feedback that would increase loss in response to melt. So let's think about feedbacks. Well, we'll go back to our, our ice sheet model here um, and make it slightly more complex. So I'm gonna replace that melt arrow with the actual components of how ice is transferred to the ocean. So we have snowfall on the top of the ice sheet that flows to the margins. Uh, we have this thing called the equilibrium line, which is, an, which is an elevation below which we lose more ice to melt than we gain through snowfall. So that's where all the loss happens. So we have surface melt below the equilibrium line. And then we also have discharge directly to the ocean. And that discharge includes calved icebergs and melting at the ice ocean boundary. So we have those kind of two uh, exit paths, those, those at two exit pathways for uh, melt to the ocean, surface melt and what we call dynamic melt or dynamic loss, uh, discharge, calving and melt from the ice ocean boundary. Uh, so what we're gonna do is look for surface boundary feedback, or we're gonna look for feedbacks at the boundaries of those, uh, of the ice sheet where we're, changing mass or, or controlling the dynamics of the, of the ice sheet. So we have surface boundary feedbacks, we have feedbacks at the marine boundary, and then we have feedbacks at the base, the basal boundary feedback. So we're gonna look at each one of those. So what are potential rapid loss feedbacks to melt? Well, there's lots and lots of them. Um, so I'm only gonna show, a, I'm only gonna go through a few that are likely to be the most important. So we have surface boundary feedbacks that include the elevation melt feedback and an albedo feedback. We have basal boundary feedbacks that include a meld and do slip feedback. And then we have fee uh, feedbacks at the marine boundary that are due to instabilities. And I'll, I'll talk about these. The, the first set of feedbacks are mostly in Greenland because they requ require an ice sheet with lots of surface melt and little narrow, relatively little narrow tidewater glaciers. Whereas the last two here require a big marine based ice sheet and that's Antarctica. So just looking at the elevation melt feedback first, uh, if we have a ice sheet that has a, a typical profile like this, uh, that profile means that if we increase, if, if we thin the ice sheet, we bring more of the surface area to lower elevation and expose it to melting. So if we go look at time one through two and three of this ice sheet as it's getting thinner, this area below the equilibrium line where we have melt is increasing through time. So that's this plot here, and it increases nonlinearly based on the slope. But it's even worse than this because if it's thinning, it's also likely warming, which means that this equilibrium line elevation is increasing through time, which provides another way that we're increasing the surface area due to melt, 
through time and making that nonlinear increase in melt area with ice thinning. So that's a potential feedback. It's important on 100 year time scales where you have substantial surface melt. The albedo feedback is somewhat similar. It's where you get the ice, the ice sheet becomes smaller. So you're exposing more rock surface. You're also exposing more uh, dirty ice on the edges in the ablation zone. And that's a feedback as melt, uh, to, to increase melt as well. Uh, at the base, we have a, this idea where we could have increased melt induced slip. And so this idea comes, it, it's it pretty uh, you know, conceptually simple to think about. You have ice and an ice sheet applying pressure to a bed. Okay, and we have two mechanisms of flow. We have deformation of the ice, and then we have sliding or slip along the ice base boundary. So if we were to add melt water we, to the base of the ice sheet, we would increase the basal water pressure. That water pressure would act against the ice pressure, reducing the effective pressure on the bed, and that could allow the ice to increase its slip. Okay, just like a, a lubrication effect. Now, this became a, a prominent topic about 20 years ago because um, Jay's Wally and others put a GPS a set of GPS units on the margin of the Greenland ice sheet for a couple of years. And what they found was that during the summer periods, the rate of motion of the, of the ice surface would increase and then decrease with melt. And so this plot uh, shows the horizontal displacement, or I guess the red here is the horizontal velocity. So we had these periods of increased velocity that corresponded with periods of increased melt. These are positive degree days here at the bottom as just measured by a, a temperature sensor. So this made people think, oh no, uh, we could have accelerated mass loss in the future with, with due to more surface melting that provides water input to the base of the ice sheet that lubricates the bed and causes it to slip away. And uh, people really latched on to this. There were a bunch of prominent news. Uh, you know, there's a New York Times article about it. Um, you know, this really, people really latched onto this idea, I think because it's so conceptually, uh, you know, kind of easy to grasp and it makes sense. But the problem is ice sheets don't actually work that way. So slip doesn't increase with melt slip increases with water pressure. So really what we're wondering is, does water pressure always increase with melt? Does more surface runoff, more melting at the surface, give us more slip, more higher water pressure at the base that will give us more slip? So the thing about ice and conduits of water through the ice and the subglacial system in the, under the ice is it doesn't behave like the plumbing system in your house. It's not like you just turn up the water and that increases the water pressure. So what happens is if we have a, uh, it can be a tunnel within the ice or at the base of the ice, if we add water in, the water goes through the, the, the pipe and comes out the other side and it exerts a pressure on the side. Okay, that's the water pressure pressing out on this tube. But we also have the ice pressure pressing back in. And in equilibrium, we have a balance between water melting the walls of the ice and ice pressure causing the, the tunnel to collapse. Okay, so in equilibrium, the rate at which we're melting out and collapsing in are equal, and the pipe stays uh, at, a, at a constant radius at a constant water pressure. So if we add water, whoop, if we add water, so we increase the flux of water into this pipe, initially, we will increase the water pressure. So we have a higher throughput, we have a higher flux of water going through that same diameter pipe, just like if you turn up the spigot <coughs> on the garden hose. Uh, water will come out faster because it's at a higher pressure. Okay, so we increase the pressure, but what happens then is that we have faster melting of the tunnel walls because we have faster throughput. We have a higher discharge of water going through the tunnel so that the diameter of the tunnel increases and also because we have a higher water pressure relative to the ice pressure, we have slower creep closure. So both of those things equal rapid dilation of the tunnel itself. And so the tunnel for under the same amount of water going through, the tunnel increases its size 
And because the tunnel area now is bigger, the cross-sectional area is bigger, the water pressure decreases, okay? And since the water pressure now decreases, but we have faster flow through the tunnel, the overall water pressure in its new steady state will be less than the initial pressure before we increase the water flux. So in, it's kind of counterintuitive, but in steady state, there's actually lower water pressures for higher water fluxes. Okay, so there's a transient response and then a relaxation to steady state that actually drops below the initial. So while we might have an initial increase in speed, <clears throat> we rapidly dilate our tunnels and we, we go to a new state that's actually at a lower water pressure and therefore a lower sliding. And so this was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this was examined both theoretically and also uh, through measurement. And so we find that actually no water pressure doesn't increase with melt. Um, it, it, if anything, it could uh, be suppressed by increased melt. And we've also done work showing this on all the outlet glaciers around Greenland that there's actually not a relationship between increasing amounts of melt and faster flow. It's much more complex than that. One way that uh, increasing water uh, access to the base of the ice sheet might increase mass loss would be to expand the zone where you have slip. So if at a certain time you have um, ice, an ice sheet that's slipping along the margins because you have water input there, if you increase the elevation to where you have water going to the bed, you might get water at the bed that was frozen in the past. Now it's not frozen, it's got water and it's slipping. So you're increasing the zone, the area of the base that's slipping. So that might be important in the future, uh, but it's still at this point really just a, we think it's a secondary effect. So I think in terms of potential loss feedbacks, we can eliminate that one at least. So then we're looking to the marine boundary. So where the ocean meets the ice. And we have three main instabilities to look at. The first one is what we call the tidewater instability that's related to these tidewater glaciers. And then the other two instabilities are related to big, deep, uh, marine-based ice sheets. Well, so Antarctica is the marine-based ice sheet we have. So we, when we, <clears throat> us glaciologists, when we think about ice sheets or we think about glaciers going into the ocean, we really think about two different classes of, of ice. We have the one on the left here, which is a big Antarctic ice shelf. So this is a, an ice shelf flowing into the ocean. Um, so you know, you can almost see the calving of a big tabular iceberg that's about to break off. Um, and then on the right, we have these narrow tidewater glaciers that fringe the Greenland ice sheet. And you also find these in Alaska as well, where you have fast flowing ice confined in a narrow fjord flowing to a calving front here. Uh, icebergs that break off tend to be much smaller. They tend to collapse off of this calving wall. You might not have an ice shelf. This cliff might extend all the way down to the base to the bed of the ocean. So thinking about uh, what controls flow at the marine boundary, whether it be in Antarctica or Greenland, uh, you have this setup with, water, with ocean water hitting ice that creates a zone of instability, okay? Just like an ice cube sitting in your, in your glass, if it's thick enough, it'll rest on the bed, but as it thins, it wants to lift off due to buoyancy. And so that's an unstable, an unstable situation. And we have an unstable, unstable situation at the fronts of glaciers. So if you think about it, we have the ocean coming up against a glacier that's flowing into the ocean. Uh, the glacier's flowing along, it might be slipping along the bed, uh, but it ends at a calving front at the boundary. And at the front, it's exerting an ice pressure along the bed, but that ice pressure is being countered. It's being lifted up by the buoyancy of the ocean in front of it. So the total pressure on the bed here is the net between that ice pressure and the, the uh, hydrostatic pressure of the ocean lifting it up. Whatever excess we have, whatever freeboard we have above flotation creates a net stress across the calving front, right? So the calving front here, this wall of ice sticking above the ocean wants to fall forward. And it wants to fall forward faster depending on how tall this cliff is, how higher the freeboard is. So the higher the freeboard is, the more stress we have, the more an iceberg wants to break off. 
So if we change anything here, we can get towards a dis disequilibrium between these stresses, or we change all of these stresses. So the first thing we can do is thin the ice, thin the glacier, say due to increased surface melting, that decreases the ice pressure at the front relative to buoyancy, which decreases the net stress across the front, but it also decreases the pressure on the bed because the ice pressure is decreased, the hydrostatic pressure of, uh, of the ocean has not. And so we have less pressure on the bed. So we have increased basal slip and the ice will flow faster due to thin. The other thing that can happen is that we can retreat the glacier, the glacier can fall back and now we have a higher calving wall, okay? Because we've, we've gone further back into the inland ice, the ice has gotten thicker. So we have a higher calving wall. So we've increased the net stress across the ice front that's pulling the ice forward that could increase calving and increase mass loss. So there's this delicate balance of changes in the basal conditions, the basal pressure conditions and changes in the dynamics of the ice front itself uh, that control how fast the ice is flowing and how fast we lose ice to the ocean. Uh, so we can look at this instability in terms of slip and pressure. Um, we, we, uh, because of this balance between pressure and flow and, uh, and the net pull across the calving front, we have an instability threshold that relates to ice thickness above flotation and the rate at which it's discharging. So ice is flowing out to the ocean. It's discharging ice at a, at a certain initial rate. Um, if the ice is thick and stable, it's sitting at high pressure above the bed, then if it thins a bit, the discharge will decrease because the ice slows. The ice slows because it loses its driving stress. So the ice flows due to its under its own weight. So if we thin the ice, it's going to flow a little slower and the discharge will decrease. And that's stable because if we, we thin, we slow, we lose ice at a slower rate, we can then thicken again, okay? That's the stable arm of this, uh, this relationship between discharge and ice thickness. As the ice gets thinner and thinner, it exerts less and less pressure on the bed. So, or, or if, if, if uh, yeah, so if the, the ice gets thinner and thinner, it exerts less pressure on the bed, and so, we start to slip more. And at this threshold, any additional thick thinning will cause the ice to flow faster and increase its discharge. Then we have an instability because that means that if we thin, we increase our discharge, we lose more ice, so we thin more. And that's when you launch into an unstable feedback, unstable feedback, okay, where you thin, you increase speed, you discharge more, so you thin more. And that's how we quick, quickly uh, lose ice. So that's the, that instability threshold. And that's determined a large part, in large part by bed topography. Once thinning is initiated and unstable thinning is initiated, the ice will thin to flotation and retreat. And if uh, we have a, a, what we call a retrograde bed slope, it's a bed slope that slopes inland, that means that the flotation height is going to increase the ice, the thickness the ice needs to be to be stable, to be above that instability threshold has to increase um, in order for the ice to regain stability. So if that flotation level is increasing inland, that means that once the ice is starting to thin, it can't become stable again until it hits a reversal in the bed slope and the bed shallows inland again because the flotation level will then decrease and that, that positive feedback towards retreat and thinning will reverse. <clears throat> so when we look at the tidewater instability, it's this, this uh, threshold condition between ice thickness and how much pressure is being exerted on the bed to control discharge. And it's largely dependent on bed topography where we have stable zones at elevated areas of the bed, and we have unstable zones where the bed is sloping inland. Because we, as we retreat, we go into deeper water and that sets up that positive feedback towards retreat. One big implication of the tidewater instability is that you can have a perturbation beginning at any time, 
that will start to thin the glacier. But as long as you're on that stable arm of the, of the instability curve, nothing really will happen until you hit that instability threshold and then you get launched into that unstable feedback. So you can have a perturbation at time zero, say 10, 20 years ago, that will cause the ice to begin to thin, but nothing much will happen until you hit that instability threshold and get launched into that positive feedback between increased loss, thinning, and more loss. So that's what we're looking out for. Are we on the way to any of these instability thresholds? So we've observed this in Greenland. Uh, this is a plot of a glacier up in Northwest Greenland that for a while was thinning and oh, I was hoping it would run, keep running it. No, let me go back to it. Okay, so the glacier was uh, just sitting there kind of not doing a whole lot until it hits the instability threshold and then rapidly increases its velocity as it re retreats. Okay, so this is a, uh, demonstrates this, uh, this threshold condition and the response of these tidewater glaciers. And if we do, if we look at a, all 200 or so glaciers along the Greenland coast, we can see this having all happened at once around the year 2000, where the glaciers thinned, they retreated, they went unstable, and they rapidly accelerated. And what we noticed was this step change in discharge. So this is ice discharge from the Greenland ice sheet through these outlet glaciers um, that had a step increase between 2000 and 2005 or so. So what we noticed was this switch between two states uh, caused by an instability. So here's that same plot again, where around the year 2000, we had a, a synchronous retreat and acceleration of all these glaciers around Greenland, or many of them, that caused this step change in mass loss. And so if we plot the annual rate of ice discharge from these glaciers by the average rate of uh, front, or this is the cumulative front change, so how much they've retreated, we really do see this switch between two states, this transition from pre-instability before the year 2000 to post-instability, driven by uh, that retreat and that unstable instability at the front and then retreat. So looking at the future, looking at model predictions going into the future, uh, we see that this loss due to retreat, the instability of these tidewater glaciers is going to dominate mass loss for at least the next 100 years or so. So this is a model output, model estimate of the, in, the, of the uh, sea level. Well, this is mass loss on the left and sea level equivalent on the right. Um, but the total mass balance here is in blue. So this is the projection for the total loss by the year 2100. And the uh, red is the surface melting and the yellow is the loss due to discharge. So that due to those tide water instabilities. And so you can see that it dominates right up to about the year 2100 when we get so much melting. And again, this is under uh, RCP, eight, eight, I, that should be, I think 8.5. Um, that's the kind of, what we look at as, as a bad case scenario. I wouldn't say worst case, because I'm sure we could do worse if we wanted to, but um, that's a, a not good scenario. Uh, so if there's lots of surface melting, eventually the surface mass balance will dominate. Another model that goes even further out into time uh, also finds the importance of these tidewater glaciers, uh, but it shows that we can only get so much mass out of Greenland. So again, we have a model projecting on the top here, the mass loss and sea level equivalent per year um, under different climate realizations. So this is the uh, watts per meter squared equivalent forcing. So 2.6 watts, uh, 4.5, 8.5. Uh, so 8.5, really bad. 4.5, probably more realistic. Um, but you see under 4.5, we don't really ever get to the red, red dash line here, which is our catastrophic sea level rise contribution. The only way we do that is if we really blast the ice sheet with huge amounts of heat under this RCP 8.5. And in that case, uh, we obliterate the outlet glaciers pretty quickly and we get a rapid surface elevation melt feedback. So that first surface feedback I was talking about where you draw down the ice sheet and you melt more surface area. So that has a big effect on Greenland under these high uh, forcing rates. Uh, on the bottom plot here, we have the percentage of the loss due to discharge, due to the tidewater instability. 
And what's actually interesting is what happens here is that the discharge contribution goes down. And that's because the glaciers all retreat back out of their, out of their fjords, basically. And then they can't discharge anymore. Um, but what happens under the worst case scenario or the worst case here is that we retreat so much that we actually go to the inland basins in Greenland that are below sea level currently. Uh, the is isostatic rebound can't work fast enough to compensate. So we, we actually get a whole nother uh, line of tidewater glaciers on, in inland Greenland, which is kind of hard to imagine. Um, but that's this rapid increase again uh, under the 8.5 scenario in terms of the contribution of discharge that up and you know, this is gonna be far into the future, but uh, could happen. So with the tidewater instability, what we see are these abrupt step changes in loss at individual, due to individual glacier geometry. And sometimes they happen to be synchronous because we have a bunch of glaciers that are all expanded out onto shoals. They're all perched on stable uh, elevated bedrock, and then they all undergo instability at about the same time. Um, so when this happens, when you hit a tidewater instability, it's fast and it can be spectacular. I mean, if you haven't watched the movie Chasing Ice, you, you really need to. It's, it's amazing. And I got a wave of graduate student applications after that uh, because people are so into it. Um, but that loss due to the tidewater, due to tidewater glacier discharge is limited because you have to have relatively synch synchronous triggering between different glaciers. You, you have to do this on a regional or ice sheet wide scale because no glacier, even region of glaciers, set of glaciers is big enough to give you one point centimeter, one centimeter per year on a vice of sea level equivalent on its own. And you really have kinematic limits, you know, just like cars trying to get out of a parking lot. You can only get so much ice out of these tidewater glaciers at once. And then the other thing is you can only get so much out of the tidewater glaciers. Eventually they'll retreat up and up onto their uh, uh, their prograding bed slopes where the where the ice gets higher out of the water as it retreats, and so we get feedbacks to stability to to limit the loss. Okay, so the last uh, in kind of big instabilities we need to worry about then to get to our centimeter per year sea level rise are the marine ice sheet and marine ice cliff instabilities. And when we're talking about with these, we're talking about marine ice sheets. And really our last marine ice sheet is West Antarctica. So mostly Antarctica, some of the big glaciers around Antarctica, but really west, the West Antarctic ice sheet. So to understand these instabilities, we have to understand buttressing. You've probably heard about ice shelf buttressing before. You know, when, when we lose some of these big icebergs and you, there's a big news story about it, they talk about the impact now on ice, uh, on the ice behind it. So the idea with buttressing is that ice sheets have, or the ice shelves around ice sheets act as a buttress to the inland ice. And the way they do this is that they ground, the ice shelf will ground out potentially on islands. So it'll, it'll come off the grounding line, impact an island, and where it hits the island, it generates resistance. It can also rub against the walls of an embayment. So if you have a mountain range on one side or maybe some slow ice on the other, the ice shelf will rub against those things and transfer its stress back onto the ice that's flowing into it. And so a buttressed ice sheet with an ice shelf that's providing buttressing will be thicker than a non-buttressed ice sheet. The implication then is if we remove this buttressing, if we take this away, the ice sheet will thin to that new equilibrium because it doesn't have the resistance on its margins. And so this is just like if, you've, if you ever go and look at a Gothic cathedral in Europe or somewhere, it's got these flying buttresses. The point of these things was to hold the cathedral walls in because they didn't want to put structural supports inside the cathedral because they want to keep it you know, big and, and open inside for the majesty of the cathedral. So they put the supports on the outside like an ex exoskeleton to keep the walls up. And so they put these flying buttresses in. So you can think of the ice shelves as flying buttresses through for the cathedral of the ice sheet. Um, so this group, uh, first at all in 2016, used uh, what we knew about ice geometry and some other parameters to actually map where ice is providing buttressing to the ice sheet. So uh, where we have dark yellows here, you can look at as important ice shelf. The darker the yellow here, the dark, more brown it is or beige or whatever, the browner it is, the more important it is, the more buttressing stress it's applying. And so the worse it is if we lose it. The bluer the ice, 
the less buttressing it is being supplied. So if we lose that ice, it's not a big deal immediately to the dynamics. And so far, some of the you know, famous ice, big ice chunks we've lost over the years, uh, one of the more recent ones, well, uh, was uh, I, recent now, I guess it was four years ago or so, uh, was this big chunk that was lost off the Larsen Sea. And of course, we're paying a lot of attention to the Larsen Sea ice shelf because it's one of the last big ice shelves on the Antarctic Peninsula. It's probably that we already lost Larsen A and B, so it kind of is the next domino to go. So everyone's looking at it. Um, and we lost this big chunk, this rift caught, that caused the icebergs here in red. Um, if we take the first at all map and actually map where that, that chunk was, we see that it's just on the edge of this blue ice. That's less important ice. If we lose any more, if we start to lose chunks in this yellow ice, then we're losing, we're taking away the buttresses and we can start to spill ice out from beneath the, uh, from the actual grounded ice on the ice sheet. <clears throat> so if we can lose ice shells, we reduce buttressing, that creates an instability. And there's two major instabilities that relate to the loss of ice shelf buttressing. That's the marine ice sheet instability and the marine ice cliff instability. And they're relevant to where we have big floating, uh, big marine based ice sheets. So this idea of the marine ice sheet instability was, is really old. It's uh, back uh, from even uh, the early 70s and, and but was kind of most famously written up in this paper by Hans Weertman in 1974. Um, but the idea here is that you have a marine based ice sheet and it's very similar to the tidewater instability um, in that you have a marine based ice sheet with accumulation flowing out of the ice sheet through the grounding line uh, into the ice shelf. And so you have some discharge going across the, uh, the grounding line. Go, Q in is the discharge into the ground line, Q out is the discharge out to the ocean onto the ice shelf. If for some reason you increase the Q out, increase the discharge out through this flux gate, possibly due to melt by the ocean, then we have an imbalance. We have more going out than we do going in. And then we start to retreat. If the bed of the ice sheet dips down, if we have this retrograde slope, that means that the gate that the ice is flowing out of will get bigger and bigger as we retreat. So we have a feedback to retreat and ice loss, very similar to the tidewater instability, but this is just kinematics. This is just ice going out is greater and increasingly greater than ice coming in as we retreat. And so, when we assess the potential for the marine ice sheet instability, we're looking for places where ice is grounded out on the edge of the continent and behind it is rapidly decreasing bed slope with nothing to stop it. And so if we look at the map of Antarctica removing the ice, this is the bed map of Antarctica, blues are below sea level. And so you can see most of East Antarctica is sitting ab above sea level. So that's not a worry. There's some areas over here like the Totten Glacier that might be. But this big area of, East, of West Antarctica where we have blues going down to purples is a big problem. This means that ice, once it retreats from this area, has nothing to stop it until the deep interior of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And so we're most concerned with these glaciers on the Amundsen Sea coast. Um, this is the Pine Island Glacier here. And even more concerning, the the Thwaites Glacier, nicknamed the Doomsday Glacier, um, because once it starts to retreat, there's nothing to stop it into these deep trenches in the center of West Antarctica. Uh, so these have gotten a lot of attention. There, there's this, uh, uh, for example, this paper in 2014 um, that used a, a model to uh, project how this glacier will change in the future. It's already uh, changing, but how it will change in the future under different melt scenarios. So the bigger the M, the worse the melting. So more ocean melt uh, over this certain scenario gives us a rapid retreat and a rapid sea level uh, contribution uh, with this one glacier alone almost contributing a half a millimeter per year. Um, now you can see there is a distinct kind of cutoff here where if we have an M1, which is current, um, or even uh, a, maybe a little bit, less, of course less, but maybe a little bit more, we have a delayed response. Uh, but if we get more heat to the ice ocean interface, we could initiate rapid retreat. Um, further work, though, on, on the marine ice sheet instability has shown that it's not unconditionally true, that sometimes you can have stabilization 
that even if you have retreat, even if you have a disequilibrium at the front, you can arrest that retreat. So one thing that can happen is that as the ice thins, you're unloading the mantle, you're unloading the, or you're unloading the lithosphere. And so you have rapid isostatic adjustment and you're raising the bed. And so that can actually counter the instability to some extent. Um, another one is that if you think about the ice shelf as in, uh, you know, in three dimensions, not just as a cross section, but if you're actually looking down on it, if you have retreat in one area, you can have uh, ice on the sides provide that bracing or buttressing from the sides. And that can actually uh, cause stability. So it's a little bit more complement, comp, uh, complicated than just that kind of kinematic uh, runaway flux view of things. So another, inst the other instability, which is the more kind of more recently appreciated one, um, really came to prominence in this paper from 2016. Uh, the marine ice ice sheet instability is on the left here. The new one, the marine ice cliff instability, is on the right. In this one, also similar to the tidewater instability, you have a retreat that causes the melt face or the calving face here to get really large. And so you have the net stress across the calving, strip, calving face increase and that rapidly pulls down the ice sheet behind it. Um, so in this case, you're basically chopping off the ice shelf and the ice due to the huge cliff that's then exposed, huge calving cliff spills out um, kind of like a closet that's you know too full and you open the door and all the stuff spills out kind of like that. Um, and so they use this idea of, or in their model, they had this marine ice cliff instability effect. Um, and <clears throat> again, if they hit their model with a, uh, a kind of a mitigated climate pathway or an increased climate, climate pathway, um, we really didn't get to, uh, well, that line should be lower, but we barely get to uh, our one centimeter per year from Antarctica, but we do get a significant increase under uh, under warming, if we hit it with this 8.5 really bad scenario, then we start to set off the uh, major glaciers area, major regions of West Antarctica like dominoes. And that's what each one of these are with the Amundsen Sea here, uh, reaching well above um, our one meter, one centimeter per year. So this could be a, an important uh, a process if we obliterate the ice shelves, basically. Um, more recent work on, on the marine ice cliff instability has again showed it's a little bit more complicated than that, where the marine ice cliff instability will be heavily dependent on the geometry, the particular geometry of that sector of the ice sheet. So here's some modeling work that was done by Jeremy uh, Basis and crowd. And uh, they found that if you have a glacier with certain bed geometry, so this is the thickness gradient, how thick, how quickly the ice gets thinner, thicker inland, relative to its bed slope, and then also its inflow velocity, you can actually have uh, stability under kind of this rapid retreat we would associate with marine ice cliff instability. You don't actually get the instability. But if you change that geometry a bit, so if you change the thickness gradient or the bed slope, you can have cases where you do get this collapse. And you can see how you know, fine a threshold it is. Uh, so it is possible but uh, not in every scenario. It's much more individualized to that particular glacier regime. Um, <clears throat> so we have loss of shelves and buttressing that can lead to those instabilities. Um, and you can, you can uh, it is possible to get them, but it's highly dependent on the conditions at the front. And also these things that we don't really know very well, like the temperature of the ice and the melt at the ice ocean boundary. And this was a, a review article from that same, uh, paper or in that same issue of science that I thought was pretty funny uh, talking about about the just models in general, but really to the marine ice cliff instability parameterized models that use extrapolations from sparse observations of a poorly understood process mean that resulting predictions of retreat rates vary considerably between model versions. Well, yeah, so extrapolating uh, poorly understood processes always results in in some wide variability of predictions. And so unfortunately, that's where we are with those. So these instabilities are clearly going to be important, but uh, depend on forcing as well as local characteristics. And so really, uh, as I finish up here, uh, what it means is that timing of these systems, the timing of retreat is everything. So we have an ice sheet, 
in the south, we have an ice sheet in the north, and these ice sheets are incredibly complex. These are velo the velocity field of the ice flow, and you can see each one of these is a little river of ice going to the margin, bringing ice to the ice ocean boundary. Each one has its own geometry. Each one will react differently. And so what we're really looking at is this major network of glaciers. And if they respond synchronously, we can get a catastrophic retreat. If they, re if they all kind of change individually, then that makes it more tolerable. So it's all about the synchronicity of the response to forcing. Um, and so that's a challenge. And as Hilmer Gunmanson put it in a 2012 paper, the stability of a given marine ice sheet configuration can most likely not be assessed from geometrical considerations only. And each situation may require targeted modeling efforts. So basically, that means we have our work cut out for us because there's hundreds of these situations that each may require a targeted modeling effort. So are the ice sheets collapsing? Um, yes, but very slowly for now. Um, catastrophic collapse will happen if we follow business as usual or even low mitigation pathways. So we're talking, you know, 650 equivalent parts per million CO2 per year uh, uh, levels. And we also really have to understand how heat in the ocean makes it to the grounding zones because that's the, the forcing that triggers those instabilities. Um, and the other key thing is that this has to occur pan-regionally impacting a lot of glacier systems at once in order to uh, get the synchronous result or the synchronous reaction to, to uh, give us the, the sea level rise that we don't want. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it with this quote from uh, James Taylor, who was way ahead of the curve back in 1977. He, he knew what was up. Um, hopefully we can, we can uh, figure it out as well. So thanks a lot for listening and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, what we usually do is by tradition, the students get to ask the first questions. So right. while they're marshalling their thoughts, I sort of uh, just ask kind of a, well, a simple question. <laughs> um, so it, it, knowing nothing really about this, uh, other than mostly what I like hear in talks or read the New York Times, you know, if you did model, uh, you know, if you do the detailed models like of Larson C, uh, can, can you then predict where, where it's going to break or how much of it's going to break off or when and all of that can you can you get pretty good at that uh you can but then you run into uh what is the forcing going to be and there's two problems with that it's the uh what we decide to do with our atmosphere and then what the oceans decide to do in response to that um, and with that amount of heat and so that you know, the big uncertainty, of course, the big, biggest uncertainty is what we're going to do. The second biggest uncertainty then is how the heat then gets transferred to the ice ocean interface and what that forcing is going to be in the future. We, we, we don't have a good handle on that. Once you can predict that forcing at the ice ocean boundary, we can get a pretty good idea of how the ice sheet is going to respond. Uh, there are, there are uh, things about the bed, we don't really know fully. There's things about um, feedbacks in the in the ice, like um, uh, anisotropy and how ice uh, becomes softer as it undergoes shear, things like that. Um, but you know, the the biggest uncertainty is the forcing. Um, and then for a lot of the ice sheet, we don't have good enough uh, constraints on things like ice thickness, where the, the shape of the bed. Great, thank you. Okay, let's have questions from students. Either just unmute and ask or raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, sometimes we have trouble with the sound of students who are in the a classroom here. Um, Hi. Oh, uh, good. Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, this isn't something we talked about, but the difference between cold-based ice that's frozen in the bed versus a uh, warm-based ice that has that melt water. I'm wondering if one thing that we're concerned about is if there is you know, substantial cold-based ice that transitions to warm-based ice with warming climate uh, that's going to increase 
ice flow, is that something that we're worried about or that's not something significant? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I think in terms of rapid response to forcing, we don't uh, simply because it takes a long time for the heat to get through the ice to the bed, uh, especially with these big, thick ice sheets. <clears throat> so, um, you know, the, the interior of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets still think it's an ice age because it's taking so long for the, for the temperature for, for the temperature perturbation to make its way down through the ice. Now, there are exceptions there. So I mentioned one of them, and that's if you bring meltwater to the bed in places that used to be frozen or not get meltwater, um, that could have a substantial impact on both the thermodynamics of the ice, and, you know, bringing its temperature up, and ice flows faster at higher temperatures. So that's an impact. And also, you might have melting at the base, which is another impact. Um, and then in some areas, you might be changing the uh, ice flow so much. So you're accelerating the glacier due to changes in dynamics. Uh, you might be changing that so much that you're increasing the shearing at the bed, which causes heating, shear heating, raising the pressure melting temperature or, or raising the uh, temperature of the bed closer to the pressure melting temperature and potentially causing melt. If you know, at least causing increased flow rates, but potentially uh, unfreezing previously frozen bed. It is possible. And we know that happens on uh, ice streams in Antarctica. So, uh, you know, we, we know that the ice streams will speed up and slow down and move kind of like braided rivers. Um, and that's due to changes in, in the temperature regime at the bed. Um, but that's not directly coupled to climate. That's due to internal dynamics. Um, hi, I'm in the classroom too. I don't know if you can see. Oh, hi. Uh, I am wondering, so I'm coming from um, a hydrology background, so definitely very different than, than knowing the digital hydrology. And I'm curious about um, what the internal hydrology of these big issues are. Like, are they porous in any way? Are they fractured? Like, is there water getting in that would change the internal temperature um, at all? Not just on the bed, but in the of the I didn't quite get it. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, internal hydrology of the ice sheets, fractures, permeability mm -hmm. uh, is what I heard. And yeah. How would that feed back into what are the feedbacks with the internal hydrology? Feedbacks of internal hydrology. Um, well, so uh, I, I, there, I, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question, but but you can always uh, correct. You know, maybe this will lead closer to it. So um, there's lots of ways that hydrology impacts ice flow. Um, I didn't have time to get into it, but these tidewater and, and marine ice instabilities <clears throat> can be related to hydrology through hydrofracture of ice. So if you have a surface of crevasses, the crevasses fill with water, water is more dense than ice. So if you have a crevasse filled with water, the pressure at the base of the water-filled crevasse is going to be always greater than the ice around it, right? The pressure pushing out, wedging its way down into the ice is always going to be greater than the ice pushing back in just due to their changes and their difference in density. And so once you initiate that crack, if you keep it filled with water, it's going to go all the way to the bed. And uh, we've, we've, we know this, we've, we can see lakes drain. I was actually on a, a project in Greenland where we were measured, we were on a boat in a lake on the Greenland ice sheet, and uh, we were taking measurements off this little inflatable boat. And then within a few days later, we weren't on, on the lake, thankfully, anymore, but it drained in about two hours, uh, just went psh, through the ice sheet. And that's because it filled one of these crevasses and just went all the way down. And so suddenly you're injecting all this water to the base of the ice sheet. That has an effect on the ice sheet. Now I showed that that's not going to have effect on the loss, the discharge of the ice sheet because of these kind of limitations in the, the, on the basal water pressure. 
but it definitely has an impact on the dynamics. And even more so, it has an impact on the dynamics of ice shelves. So if you have an ice shelf and you have a crevasse, or you just have a, a depression filled with water, through hydrofracturing, if it goes to the base, it's going to the ocean and it's breaking the ice shelf. Okay, and so this is a really efficient way to blow up ice shelves. And it's already happened um, twice, at least um, on the, the Larson A and B. We actually could see it uh, with remote sensing. We could see all of these water-filled crevasses and ponds, and then we could see the ice shelf just explode because of the hydrofracture. And so this is something we're worried about happening further and further in, down latitude in, in Antarctica as warming happens and we get more meltwater on the ice shelves. So it, hopefully that got maybe to your question. Um, I'll, I'll ask like a brief follow-up question. I know there's another question in the chat. Um, I was, my question is actually more about the thermal regime. So is there enough, basically, is there enough plumbing in, in uh, ice sheet systems or will there be with increased melt or increased heat to change the thermal regime within, this, within the, the ice sheets? It, it, so it, is there enough plumbing? So, so like, are you transporting enough water that would presumably be at higher temperature mm -hmm. to the interior of the ice that you might change? Yeah. The yeah. Okay. Um, so generally not where that, so, so um, generally not that far inland in ice sheets, usually where you have water that's coming from the surface that isn't coming from, you know, basal melting due to the ice being at the pressure melting temperature uh, inland on the ice. So not, you know, where you have climate forcing on the margins, generally not. The ice is already warm there. Um, where, where it could make a difference is uh, if you had uh, water penetrating shear margins, so where you have crevassing, similar to the hydrofracture thing, where if you have water getting into the ice sheet that way, you could cause warming of the shear margins and that warming could cause ice softening and faster flow because the ice is softer and can't hold the flow of an ice stream or a glacier back anymore. So it speeds up. So that might be a, a scenario. Is, is that what you were thinking about? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate okay. it. Hey, let's, uh, since we're after five, let's open up to anyone who wants to ask a question. Of course, students can still ask questions. Uh, there, there is one in the chat. It says, how well known are the glaciers surrounding the Arctic Ocean? And will changes there affect the methane hydrate on the continental shelf and slope? <clears throat> well, uh, how well known are the glaciers surrounding the Arctic Ocean? Um, so in terms of, of glaciers, in the Arctic, uh, there's not much on the continental shelf. Uh, there, there's not a whole lot left uh, sticking out onto the continental shelf. Um, they're, they're mostly land terminating with some little, little tidewater glaciers sticking down into fjords. Um, so I, I don't think that'll affect uh, any kind of geochemistry on the shelf. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm that's best I can do there. I'm certainly not an expert, though, on uh, in, in terms of uh, methane hydrates, so I'd have to defer that one. Um, I had a I had a quick question on the isostatic adjustment. Um, so, without having read the, the paper by Barrietta and Science that you mentioned, um, do do you have a sense of the time scale as uh, associated with the uh, I said a rebound of Greenland when we we're melting um, the ice sheets on top of Greenland. Uh, how quick is that bowl shape Greenland gone out of ice? That's up. Uh, the interior? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think we know well because we don't. You know, we get this from GPS units that we put on bedrock, and all all the exposed bedrocks along the edges. So we don't have direct measurements from the interior. And it's the same problem we have in Antarctica. Uh, I, I think in Greenland, generally the areas of rapid uplift are pretty localized around 
where we have glaciers retreating. So at the margins, especially in areas where we have rapid tidewater glacier retreat. And there you can have um, uplift rates of, of you know, centimeters per year, um, really fast uplift rates approaching you know, even, even a decimeter um, like we find down in, in Amundsen Sea. But in the interior, it's the, the mass is much more stable. The, the Greenland ice sheet isn't, and the Antarctic ice sheet in the interiors, the, the mass is not changing quickly yet. Okay, that's pretty fast. <laughs> but yeah, okay, thanks. You wanna, wanna ask uh, not one final question? <laughs> Getting some. Is that a, just a thumbs up, Larry, or is that a, oh, I no, have a question. That, that, was a, that was a raise hand. Oh, okay, it was a raise <laughs> thumb. <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, Ian, this is Larry Edwards. Uh, that was a, just a really dynamite discussion of the different factors that affect uh, ice mass balance. And it really, really fantastic. Um, I, I just had a quick question. I mean, I could ask a bunch, but I'll, I'll just ask one since Donna said one more question. <laughs> um, and I was just curious, the, the ice cliff, the model that included the ice cliff, I guess that's pertinent to, to Thwaites Glacier. Um, you know, when I look at that, it, it looks really simple in your cartoon, right? So the cliff gets higher and it's more likely to fall over. And the physics of that, you know, doesn't seem to be too complicated. But my understanding is that that those kinds of models are, you know, that there's unknown physics. And then you also mentioned, um, you know, there's a lack of observation. So could, could you just, um, you know, so if you were uh, needed to improve that model, what, what, do, what uh, that we don't know in terms of observations and in terms of physics, do we need to know to improve that model? Yeah, well, to improve the physics of the model, it's, it's really in, just incorporating a kind of better resolution of how cliff failure occurs. So, you know, and this, we run into the problem of you have a, you want to model the whole ice sheet, right? And so you're limited in computation, you know, you can only make your grid so small, you know, and then if you take your, a, a, a smaller area, you can apply a higher resolution model that can capture more of the mechanics of the calving front. And that's what that, that uh, second paper by, um, that, that Jeremy did, where they actually took a focused model, much higher resolution model, uh, you know, that allowed for complicated fracture of the calving front rather than just, you know, chopping off the shelf. And what they found is that if you include those, those complicated terminus dynamics, the, the ice breaks off in a way that helps for, for certain geometries that helps stabilize the front. So it breaks off in a way that creates some pressure back on the ice cliff that keeps it from falling apart so fast. Um, and it, it's, it's due to how calving blocks rotate, which when you think about it is a bit scary. If we need to predict sea level rise from ice sheets using models, if we have to model every calving block rotation during retreat of a continental scale ice sheet, it's gonna be a while before we can do a really good job predicting, predicting things, especially when we don't even know what the temperature of the ice is. Thanks so much. That's that's really nice. Thanks. Well, let's uh, let's thank Ian again by whatever means you have available on Zoom. I'm going to clap. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Ian's visit with us will continue via Zoom and some meetings tomorrow. So I look forward to talk, talking to you myself. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you.